Hello, Keith Rocker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, I'm uh, going to put together a little odds and ends video for you this week. I've got several things over here that have come into the shop recently I want to share with you. And, and, and to be just totally honest, I just haven't had a whole lot of time to get out into the shop uh, over the last week or two. Work is really getting busy this time of year. This is a busy time of year for me at work. I have been away from home a good bit. Um, just out and about and just been tied up really bad. So it's really cut into my shop time, plus had some family obligations going on that has uh, kept me out of the shop as well. But things haven't really stopped too much uh, and a lot of new stuff has come in and I wanna share some of the stuff with you. If I don't go ahead and get this video done, it's gonna pile up and it's gonna be too much to cover. So um, let's just get at it. We'll tear in here and show you some cool things that we got going on. So up first, I uh, got a, some parts in here for my metal planer I want to share with you guys. And if you've been following my metal planer restoration, you probably remember when we took these pretty nasty looking bevel gears out of that machine. And this was honestly at the time a pretty major setback for me because I knew that this was going to be a big deal to get new bevel gears uh, made. Um, yes, I have made a bevel gear. I made a bevel gear for the metal planer and I had a video on that. Uh, could I have made these bevel gears? If I had had the right tools, the right cutters for this particular pitch, yes, I probably could have. Although when I did that bevel gear video, I talked about some of the difficulties in making a bevel gear on a dividing head on a horizontal mill machine versus getting a true involute, cutting it on a, like a gear shaper. And uh, why really you can, you can get the job done, but there's better ways to do the job. And because I didn't really have in-house what I needed, I reached out to a, uh, a friend. I actually met him up in Milwaukee a year ago when I was up uh, getting the bed ground on my planer. Uh, but WJ over at American Machine and Gear Works. And uh, we have remained friends, uh, communicated back and forth. I reached out to him and said, hey, is this something you can help me out with? And he graciously agreed to take this project on and uh, he actually made these gears. Actually, I think his apprentice made this, these gears. He used this as an as a opportunity to train his apprentice on how to make some bevel gears in, in uh, using some of their more advanced gear making machinery. So no, I didn't make these. I would have loved to have made these in my shop. I just, again, I just didn't really have what I needed to do it and do it right and I decided to just farm this job out. So anyway, I wanted to show you guys these, uh, these beautiful gears. These things came out absolutely fantastic. They uh, completely machined them up there, um, did all the gear cutting on them, sent them back to me. Uh, once they got here, I had to do a little bit of a uh, fine tuning to get them to fit just right. Uh, they were just a little bit uh, oversized on a couple of the parts, but really just some emery cloth on the lathe was all it took, and these gears fit perfectly right out of the bat. As far as the gear mesh and and the the, the actual gear cutting part, uh, they nailed it right on. And I and the other measurements that were a little bit large, they purposely made them a little bit large because I wasn't able to get really super accurate. Uh, measurements on what they need to be and I knew that I could take care of that once they came in. So we will be installing these in an upcoming video uh, but I did just want to kind of share this guys, share the, these, these, these gears with you and kind of show you uh, what was there. I will tell you that uh, uh, WJ doesn't really have a YouTube channel but he posts a lot of material over on Instagram and Facebook and you can follow him there under American Machine and Gear. Uh, you look, look him up, follow him, always has some really cool content going on. And uh, I'll say this too, I get a lot of inquiries from people about gear making and whatever. I can, I can make spur gears, but a lot of gears I really just have not set up. These guys can make pretty much anything out there. And I actually refer a lot of people to contact them uh, for very custom gear jobs because they're really set up better to do uh, gear making better than I am. But anyway, I wanted to just give a quick shout out, show these beautiful parts to you, and uh, we'll be putting them on the planer coming up soon. Next item here is an eBay find. Uh, I've been looking for one of these for a while, but I finally, finally picked one up. And what I've got here is a taper micrometer. Now, you guys very well may have seen me using uh, this taper micrometer. This is one that I've had for a while now. 
uh, but it is the larger version. And it seems like every time I've used this, I've needed the smaller one. I didn't have one. It took me a while to pick one up, but I finally was able to grab a taper micrometer and the smaller size. So if you've never seen a taper micrometer, uh, what this is used for is to measure a taper or an angle, a uh, very precise measurement, and it's a really interesting device. It's not really used to measure uh, a distance, it's used to measure an angle. So you basically just put this on a piece, you get a, a whatever taper item you got in there, you adjust this bottom anvil to whatever thickness you need, and you put your tapered piece in here, and then using this micrometer head, you adjust it until you get a nice fit in there. And this works very much similar to a sign bar. If you're familiar with a sign bar, uh, where you basically are measuring, this is exactly one inch, and you're measuring how far above zero, zero would be parallel to this piece below it. You're measuring how far, and mathematically, you can calculate using some trigonometry tables or trigonometry on your calculator to calculate an angle. Uh, and like I said, I have used the bigger one quite a few times, but every time I've used it, I've had to put an extra block or two down the bottom because I really needed the smaller version. Uh, this one here's got eh, a little bit rough on the thimble, but it, it operates perfectly. And it's in the nice wooden box, and I'm sure that this is something that I'm going to get a chance to use. But uh, these are not very common. They're kind of difficult to find. Uh, it took me a while uh, for one to pop up on eBay, uh, and I was able to, to get it at a, what I thought was a fairly decent price. And now I basically have the set. They, they made these in two different sizes, and uh, I have the matching pair to the other one. And this is something that will get used. In fact, I got some jobs coming up soon that you'll probably see this, uh, this tool in action. Uh, but anyway, Taper Micrometer, made by the Taper Micrometer Corp uh, up in uh, Worcestershire, Massachusetts. And uh, glad to have that and glad now to have the pair. Next item here is another purchase that I made. I found this one on an uh, email that I get from a uh, company that, that's always selling old interesting tools. And this popped up. Uh, pretty decent price and this is a tool I didn't have so I decided to go ahead and buy one. What this is is an angle vise. Uh, you can use it on mill machine, you can use it on a surface grinder or whatever uh, when you need to put in a, a nice angle and basically you got your jaws up here. It's, it's nice, it got some notches in there so you got something round that you want to either put on the front side or sticking straight up it'll go in there or you can just use it like a regular vise. Uh, but this thing tilts up at different angles. You can set it, lock it down. You got some supports here, lock it down and uh, do machining on a precision angle. So again, something that I have needed several times, haven't really had one in the shop. Uh, saw it come available on a tool sale and took advantage of it and brought it in. It's now in the arsenal. So another little update here on the metal planer restoration. Again, if you've been following that series of videos, I'm sure you saw a while back where uh, I talked about these particular parts. Uh, on my metal planer, I don't have this gear in this pulley. I actually borrowed this from a friend of mine, Andrew Alexander, who has the same metal planer. He was gracious enough to take these parts off of his machine and send them down to me so that I could um, make some copies of these or, or, and, and be able to recreate these two parts. So this gear and this pulley both mount. I had this bracket back here. That part was on my machine. Uh, again, this is the one off of his and the, the pulley just mounts on the back side back there. So I wanted to kind of give you guys, guys an update of where we are on this. So what I did was I took these, um, these two castings here and I drew them up in Fusion 360, uh, basically a 3D CAD software package and uh, design patterns so that I could cast blanks to, 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 to make these two pieces. So these are my patterns. This particular pattern here is for the gear. Uh, of course, you can see the basic shape there. We will machine uh, the, the casting and cut the teeth into it later, but this is a, a split pattern. Um, that would go into the sand. Actually, it already has gone into the sand. I sent these over to Clark Easterling at Windy Hill Foundry, and uh, he was able to go ahead and get the casting. So that's, that's one of my patterns. This pattern uh, was made on the 3D printer, and the second pattern is uh, this one right here for the pulley. It's also a split pattern. It's made in two pieces. 
Uh, you would have two, two pieces, two molds that basically you'd, you'd ram these up in sand. And it's always nice to have a split pattern where you can actually do the two halves rather than trying to do it in one solid piece. So I drew these things up. Uh, this pattern here, instead of 3D printing, um, I actually had a friend of mine, Mike Wiggins at the Backyard Machine Shop. They've got a CNC router where he works at and uh, they actually made this on the CNC router. It was made out of a solid piece of wood. Uh, actually, it was made out of a glued up section of MDF is what they use, but uh, basically solid piece of wood. Of course, we painted them um, after they were machined. I had to do a good bit of sanding and sealing to get these things painted. Uh, Clark put the kind of this graphite material on this bigger piece to help uh, get it out of the sand mold. So from the patterns, uh, Clark has sent me the castings. So there's the casting for the uh, pulley. This is the casting for the gear blank. And again, we've got to do the machining on these to get them finished up. Uh, but we have come a long way on this and uh, they came out great. Now I will tell you guys that uh, Clark at Windy Hill Foundry has got a YouTube channel. He actually did a video on uh, molding and pouring these. So if you're interested in seeing that process, if you're not familiar with the foundry process, I'd encourage you to go take a look at that video. I'll put a link to it down in the description of this video so that you can go take a look at that uh, and you can see how these were done. Um, came out really nice. I'm very happy with the results. And again, uh, you'll be seeing these in a future set of more videos coming up because both of these have to be machined and turned into their final parts. But I did just kind of want to give you a quick update. I thought that was pretty cool. I uh, also want to, at some point in time, do a video talking about pattern making and some of the things you need to do when you, you're designing a pattern for a casting. Um, I know a lot of people have been sending Clark uh, some patterns that really are not made properly. And if you know a few little things about pattern making, kind of wrap your mind around it. Uh, it would really help Clark out a lot. And I was going to, at some point in time, again, I want to just do a little bit kind of a pattern making one-on-one, -on -one, whether you're making a pattern uh, by hand or whether you're designing it in software like I did these. Uh, but, you know, these, these patterns have to have draft on them so that they'll pull from the sand. They ideally need to be in this, in the case of like these split patterns where you have two patterns rather than just you know, taking a casting and put in there. Could he have cast this from the original? In this case, probably, well, he probably could have, but it wouldn't have been the right size. We wouldn't have had enough material in there to actually machine it away. So we really need to make patterns. Um, need to have radiuses in the corners. We don't want to have any sharp corners anywhere on it. It needs to be super smooth and sanded out. There's just several little things you need to know about this. And there's also shrink involved. Uh, when these me molten metal is poured, as it cools, this part is going to shrink. So basically, we have to make the pattern a little bit larger than the final casting in order to take that, take that shrink in. But anyway, anyway I want to do a video on, on that at some point in time and just kind of talk about how to make a good pattern. Uh, these worked out good for Clark. Uh, he did have one issue on this one in the mold where uh, it didn't come out right the first time, but that was just a, a molding issue. That really wasn't a pattern problem. It was just the, the way it turned out in the mold. But once he saw what happened, he was able to go back and fix it. And I'll let you go watch the video to see exactly what went on there. But again, just a quick update. Thought you guys might enjoy seeing those farts and you will be seeing these in future videos. So up next is really just kind of a interesting item that was sent in by a viewer. Uh, this was sent in by John DeRosa. John is a longtime viewer of the channel. And uh, uh, just so you'll know, he he's buys and sells a lot of taps. Uh, he'll go to auctions and sales and whatever. And when they have a lot of uh, taps, he'll buy large quantities. And then he turns around and resells them uh, on eBay. He's got a store, I think, where he resells these. And he's actually helped me on several occasions find oddball taps because he just comes across some weird stuff. And he, I, I wasn't expecting this. This showed up in the mail the other day, but uh, this package showed up and he told me the story about this tap. He said he bought a lot, large lot of taps and he pulled this one out and when he saw it, so that's interesting. It's, uh, it says on here 3816. Uh, it's a pulley tap basically. 
And uh, he said, that's an interesting, you know, that's, that's, it, it's, it's not that unusual of a tap. But then we looked at it, said, something doesn't look right on it. So we started looking at it. And, okay, it's 3816. Uh, it's left hand. Okay, that's kind of, that's a little bit odd, but again, you know, less common, I guess, but, but not terribly unusual. And he started looking at the pitch on these things, like, man, that sure is a coarse pitch. So he said, well, that must be a double start tap. So if you're not familiar with a double start tap, uh, instead of having one helical that goes around and around, or basically is two helicals that go around, and you end up with a steeper pitch on it. So he started counting them, and no, what and double? Must be three. No, not three. This thing actually has six leads on it. It's a three eight sixteen, but it has six different leads on it. So six different starts down here in the bottom, uh, which is just crazy. I mean, I, I have no idea what this tap would have been used for. Neither did he. Uh, and he says, I'm going to send this to Keith because it's just, it's just kind of interesting. This is something that I'm going to go over and put in my tap cabinet. I doubt I will ever need a 3816 left-hand six-start tap. But uh, if I ever do, <laughs> I got one. I'm sure that this was made for a custom-made tap for a very specific job. Um, who knows what? Why would you want a six lead tap? Well, it adjusts in and out very quickly. So if you think about it, one revolution of this, rather than going one sixteenth of an inch, it's gonna go six sixteenths of an inch. So, you know, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna screw in and out very quickly. Um, anyway, just an interesting item. Thought you guys would enjoy seeing that. John, thanks for sending it in. Um, just whatever. So he says to keep it for Emergency use only. <laughs> if I ever need that, it probably is going to be an emergency. John, thanks a lot. I appreciate you sending that in and sharing it. Up next, got a really nice collection of tools and tooling uh, from Russell Ingman up in Warren, Massachusetts. And uh, he had contacted me a week or two ago and told me he, he used to, I guess he really still does have a machine shop. He says several years ago, he kind of downsized, sold a bunch of stuff and uh, really went into a smaller shop. Uh, I think the, just not doing as much work, didn't have as many people working for him. And in the process, he just got a bunch of stuff that he wasn't using and wanted to know if we could make use of some of this. And I said, absolutely, uh, and was glad to, to get some of this. This will be some really nice things that we can use in the shop. So uh, he also uh, sent a couple pictures of his shop along. I'm going to throw these up on the screen just to kind of show you guys um, his, his place up in Massachusetts. Uh, so you can kind of take a look at it. Uh, but Russell, I appreciate it greatly. This, uh, what we got here is um, some tooling, number one. So we got some uh, face mill cutters here that we can use over on the horizontal milling machine. These are some uh, like angle dovetail cutters. Again, it goes on the face mill type uh, setup. These are really nice. Uh, and th this is some kind of stuff. I got a ton of horizontal mill tooling, but not really this kind of stuff. There's another uh, face mill. It looks like it's brand new. If it's been used, it's been used lightly. Here's a uh, surface gauge for the surface plate. Um, you can mount indicators on these. They would have had a scribe or something on them originally. These, these are also very handy. This is a nice big one. I use these a lot when I'm rebuilding machines because you can do some really cool things with them, running on ways, making measurements with indicators and so forth like that. I uh, got some uh, calipers here, outside calipers, and this is a neat caliper here. So if you ever need to scribe a line and you want it to be parallel to your work, uh, you can just kind of come in here and run this down the side and it will scribe in on a piece of metal. You can put some bluing fluid on there or something like that. Set that down a little bit deeper, but... Anyway, th this is a real handy layout tool. Uh, got some nice big end mills. So these are, you know, all of these are inch and a half, inch and an eighth, one inch and larger end mills. Again, something that will be very handy to use over on the horizontal milling machine. Uh, I've got a vertical head coming for that. Uh, haven't picked it up yet, but I, we talked about wanting to get one. So these will be really handy over there for some heavier duty stuff. Uh, these are sets of uh, radius gauges. This is a really handy tool if you never use these so you, you basically this is 11 30 seconds radius and all the different 
radiuses and you're all 11 30 seconds so in here out here on the ends you got concave convex bull nose different things so you can use these to check a radius uh, on on items when you're either when you're trying to look and see what a radius is on something that's already built or you're just double checking something very handy set of tools to have around the shop this is a cool mist type deal so you would uh put some air to this you would drop this tube down into your coolant it's got a little filter on the end and then this you could adjust to to, to mist, put a mist. I use one of these over on my surface grinder. Uh, you can use them on your milling machine in lieu of a flood coolant where you're not making quite a big of a mess. This back here is really nice. This is a do more tool post grinder. You use these on the lathe uh, for do, uh, doing external grinding. Basically you mount this on the tool post and you send along a bunch of uh, uh, grinding discs that go on there as well. And I'm really excited about this. This is a really nice, uh, Albrit uh, keyless chuck. This is this is the real deal here. This is the one everybody wants. Uh, really nice item. It's got an R8 spindle on here, so this go right up on my mill machine. I've got a uh, keyless chuck over there on my mill now, but honestly, this is going to probably become my my user because this one is a lot better, a lot nicer than the one I've got over there. Uh, really nice tool. So uh, as long as this thing runs true, and I have no doubt that it does. This is gonna become my main user for sure. And got a face mill. This is something that I can mount to a face mill holder, put over on the horizontal mill, takes carbide inserts, a little five tooth cutter. This will be a really handy tool again over on the horizontal mill. Um, nice, nice addition right there. I'll, I will definitely put that to work. So anyway, some very nice tooling sent down. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go put all this stuff up where it needs to go into the shop, but definitely some stuff we can use uh, and put to good use. So anyway, nice to have some really cool stuff here. So thank you very much uh, for sending these along. Uh, Russell, greatly appreciated. Thank you, sir. So I thought I'd give you guys a quick update on Ginger. This is Ginger, Mary Ann, our two shop cats that we uh, found abandoned on the side of the road a couple of weeks ago. They have uh, been acclimated to the shop now for a week or two, probably about a week and a half. I'm amazed at how much these little kittens have grown during that period of time. They have near about doubled in size, both of them have. And uh, they are being kittens, uh, having a really good time out here playing and exploring in the shop. Uh, Ginger, the little redhead over here, she is uh, definitely probably the more courageous of the two. Uh, Mary Ann's a little bit shyer, uh, but anyway, they're, they're having a good time in the shop and they're gonna jump off the table now. <laughs> Thought I'd give you a quick update. Everybody's asking about the cats. Next items up here. I got some new machinist jacks for the shop and I'm, I'm pretty excited about these. These are all made by Armstrong. Uh, I have some smaller machinist jacks that are made by Armstrong, but I didn't have any real tall ones like this. In fact, I've never even seen this style jack before. Um, just haven't come across them. Some of you other guys probably have. Uh, but Chuck Gauss, who's down in Florida, uh, he's a big, uh, one, of the, one of the main guys down at the Florida Flywheelers Association that has the big uh, tractor show and swap meet a couple of times a year although I don't think they're going to be able to have it this year because of COVID. But anyway, he, I got to know him from, from going down to the Florida Flywheeler show, and we've become pretty good friends. He's in machining and stuff. He went to an auction down in Florida, and he bought a pallet basically full of these different jacks. And he wanted a few of them for himself. He was gracious enough. He reached out to me and said, hey, do you want some of these jacks? I basically wanted to get like a set of four of each size for myself. So there's... Uh, let's see, we got these back here are basically nine inches. These are like seven inches. These are like four inches and these are like three inches. So there was a set of four of everyone except the three inches. There's only three of those, but there were some extra ones uh, in the lot. And he said, Keith, just take those with you. And uh, Chuck is wanting to sell these he's wanting to find a home for him he's basically trying to get some of his money back out of them so if anybody's interested there's basically three of the of the tall ones 
in six of the smaller ones. Um, send me an email for details and uh, you know if you're interested in them maybe we can work out a deal on some of these because he is trying to basically get some of his money back out on that lot. I purchased these from him uh, for my my use in my shop and uh, these need to find a home. But if you're not familiar with machinist jacks, they're extremely handy. Sometimes they're called planer jacks. They were used often on metal planers uh, for big castings that were kind of a regular shape where you needed to support them in different areas. And it's really nice to have um, different sizes of these things for different kinds of setups. And like I said, I've had some smaller ones, probably up to about this size, although a different style, also made by Armstrong. But I, there's been several times I've needed bigger ones that I've just had to kind of put pieces of metal up underneath things, whatever, to, to get that jack to engage. So uh, real excited to find these. These are nice. Uh, this one is a this one is a model uh, 354. This is a 353, 352, and a 351 are the numbers on these. Uh, they very well have made them in even larger sizes. They probably did. Uh, but anyway, really nice tool. So anyway, if you are interested in some of these, uh, like I said, shoot me an email. I will, I'm going to get with the details with you on them and see if we can't work out a deal to find a good home for a couple of these. Next comes a little package that came in from Bob Meek and uh, Bob sent along. This was actually a very nice surprise. I wasn't expecting this package and this is definitely something that uh, can be used around here. But he sent along a bunch of oilers. So these are kind of the old brass and glass oilers that you find on machines. You flip a little switch and basically it starts dripping oil into a tube or into a hole. So like on Babbitt bearings and so forth, you can keep things lubricated. Down here we got some, um, these are a little twist type this so is you put grease in these usually but you twist them and they uh, put a little bit of shot in there at a time you see these on all kinds of old machinery and steam engines and so forth uh, some really nice stuff to have laying around because this stuff is getting harder and harder to find these are actually uh, some sight glasses that are used on a boiler for checking water level uh, I'll probably take these out to the museum because we can use them uh, we, we use these on our boilers and we have to replace those from time to time um, to keep them safe and uh, they're getting harder and harder to find and what these are these are actually the the glass pieces that go into oilers so again this is something that is uh, getting a lot harder to find you used to be able to just go to your hardware store and get replacement glass for these uh, oilers and I, I don't know we, we were actually looking for some of these out at the museum not long ago and having a really hard time finding a source uh, to buy these uh, so, uh, again, nice to have some spare parts around for uh, when you break an oiler, you need to be able to change them out. Uh, in fact, I'm hoping this bigger one is going to fit one that we broke. We were actually looking for one and couldn't find it. I'm, I need to take this one out to the museum. This may be just the one we need. Hopefully it is and we can uh, fix one of the oilers that got broken out there. So, anyway, Bob, thanks for sending these along. There's some gaskets and some other little pieces in here. Uh, to kind of help out with this some type of stuff. He said it was some things he had collected over the years that were laying around the shop. Uh, interesting that these, uh, some of these glass pieces were wrapped up in like some newspaper or newsprint and I uh, unwrapped a couple of them and they were, uh, some of the stuff was dated in the late 70s and early 80s. So, you know, there's getting to be some age on some of these things. They've been sitting in his possession obviously for quite a long time. Uh, but very nice to have these these parts because they're getting harder and harder to find. Bob, thanks uh, for sending those in. And with that, I think we have worked through our pile of stuff over here that we needed to go through. And I hope you guys saw some cool things in there that you found interesting. Uh, I know I did, and I was glad to pick up some new things here. Some of these were viewer mail items sent in from viewers. Some of them were purchases. Some of them were just acquisitions, what have you. But uh, all interesting things for the shop. And uh, with that, guys, uh, that is gonna be a wrap on this video. I do hope to have some, pretty much the weekend to get out here and get back on some projects. I'm getting behind on some things, some work that I need to get finished up. And I'm hoping that this weekend I'm gonna finally be able to kind of get back out here and have some more machining content for you guys real soon. Um, but just bear with me, busy time. Uh, I only have so many hours that I can spend out here in the shop working on things and 
Uh, I've gotten a little bit behind here lately with just so much going on, but we're going to get back out here real soon. Guys, that will be a wrap. As always, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Those thumbs up are appreciated, as are those comments, and uh, we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching.